first thing I think of when I hear the title Gimme Gimme Good Lovin' was just how how strange it was that we came about to record it in the first place. Uh, the song uh, was originally recorded by a band called Crazy Elephant and it was less than two minutes long. Um, we, we needed another song for the Walking the Razor's Edge album and our, our manager Bill Sipe uh, managed a band called Mike Biker and the Kickstands uh, that played 50s and 60s songs and this song came up as a suggestion to us. Uh, they wanted us to helixize it so what we did uh, Paul Hackman uh, got on the phone with Mike Biker. Uh, Keith told him the chords of the song uh, over the phone and told him what the words are and Paul went away and came back with the arrangement of it. And when we uh, went to do the video for that song in Los Angeles, uh, we had been playing uh, the night before in Louisville, Kentucky with Rat and basically we walked off stage in our wet, smelly leather uh, grabbed our guitar cases, got directly into a van and drove to the airport. We got changed at the airport, uh, slept on the plane overnight to Los Angeles. When we got to Los Angeles we were met at the airport by uh, Bill and immediately taken to uh, Francis Ford Coppola's studio in uh, Hollywood where we were to uh, film the video for Gimme Good Lovin' and uh, we were met there by a bevy of uh, beautiful ladies from uh, Wii Magazine, Playboy, Hustler, and the uh, famous porn star Tracy Lords. Uh, there were so many uh, half-naked women, in fact, that Richard Pryor came over to uh, watch his film, as did Robin Williams and Rip Taylor. They were all next door uh, filming Pryor's Place, the uh, kids show, and uh, they came over to watch us film. They actually were excited to meet us because we were, to them, rock stars. And we're meeting movie stars, but we're not thinking that we're these big guys they think we are, but we, you know, here we are meeting Robin Williams and uh, how they were, how they, he was just like he would be on film. He just talked, he was rambling off stuff, making us laugh. Brian had his uh, eight millimeter camera going and um, got it all on film and uh, pretty neat, I'm glad we did. Good pictures that day and then uh, they got to see some filming. That was pretty neat. <laughs> the uh, video eventually came out in two versions, one with the girls topless and one uh, a regular version and uh, made uh, much, uh, much Music's top 10 band video uh, list. And uh, we always used to hear rumors that Much Music would accidentally uh, stick it on late at night when nobody was looking and uh, the topless version would uh, be seen uh, on Much Music. Brian wrote the lyrics for it. Uh, based on a letter he received from a fan in Poland that said uh, it was so, this is back when the Iron Curtain was still up, uh, how refreshing it was uh, to hear North American music because they, they had to sneak it in. Uh, it wasn't free to be able to, uh, to listen to. They, they, they could be arrested if they were listening to it on the radio. That was, it was contraband. And we thought that was a uh, great uh, uh, theme for a song, just freedom and the freedom we enjoy in North America to uh, enjoy music and uh, basically do whatever we want to do. Um, we did the uh, video at the Massey Ferguson plant in Toronto, once again directed by uh, Rob Corley, and uh, the video went to uh, medium, rota uh, medium rotation on uh, MTV in the United States and heavy rotation on Much Music in Canada. Uh, what comes to mind when uh, I think about Kids Are All Shaken was, I guess, uh, for me, was again the, uh, the making of uh, the video back then with, uh, with the incredible makeup job that they, they did on uh, Brian Ballmer's uh, face. Yeah, it was pretty neat. Uh, the Kids Are All Shaken video came out and um, we were now, at that time, touring in America with uh, uh, Accept, Balls to the Wall hits. and. Uh, Keel, a band that was um, at later went country. Ron Keel went country, and um, it was neat because they were kind of like our level of band, just come out of the clubs, and they were on this big tour, and uh, how they were accepting it and accepting it. Oh, <laughs> good about it being, and uh, learning about the, the German group Accept. I mean, you know uh, how it was when they toured in Germany, because uh, I mean we'd been over there with Kiss already and kind of like, you know, so we had something in common to talk about. Stefan Kaufman, the drummer, uh, taught me a lot about playing and uh, how to apply heavy drums to music and, and it really helped. It was always, every time I met these guys, I always, I always picked up something off them. And uh, it was just a, another tour that uh, 
just had to be written in the history books of Helix for sure. <laughs> We wrote Heavy Metal Love at the uh, Queen's Hotel up in Seaforth, pulled this really cool lick and uh, I had this idea of writing a song um, kind of uh, uh, like my rock and roll baby only pertaining to heavy metal and so we came up with the title Heavy Metal Love and we wrote it real quick, put it on stage, I think uh, we came up with the idea on a Friday night, put it on stage on the Saturday. Um, the song uh, ended up uh, being a big hit for us in the United States because uh, it got heavy rotation with the, with the video on uh, MTV in the States. And it was the first year for MTV and, and uh, we had no idea of the impact of TV and, and uh, here we were pulling into places like Washington DC and there'd be a lineup for the band uh, a block long. We were, we were just blown away. We, we did a, a beer commercial for, uh, for one of the big Canadian breweries with Heavy Metal Love. It, it actually uh, was supposed to be Rock You uh, and we took some, some of the tracks from the recording and sang along, give me a B, B, L, am I allowed to, to <laughs> give me a B, B, L, L, U, U, E, what you got blue, what you gonna do? We always used to say, Drake it. But unfortunately, they released it to radio before the single had been released to radio. And so our, our record company, EMI, uh, called up the, the, uh, the people that were putting out the, the commercial and said, you can't do this. This is not, uh, this is not a good thing. Uh, so we went back in and we re-recorded Heavy Metal Love to uh, Drink La Bats Blue. Da -da 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 Drink La Bats Blue. And which, uh, that, that was fun. The song Heavy Metal Love was written about Joan Jett and uh, became a huge hit for us. And um, we ended up uh, touring Europe on that album, which was the No Rest of Wicked album. And uh, one day we were in uh, some place in Europe, and I remember the uh, EMI uh, representative came down with this huge, huge posters. Uh, it said um, uh, Helix Heavy Metal Love uh, with on tour with Kiss. And uh, the posters were huge, they were about four feet wide, six feet high, and they uh, gave about a hundred to Kenny, and so Kenny went and put them up all over this huge auditorium we were playing at, and uh, it took them all day long to put up all these posters, and uh, around, I'd say about five o'clock, Kiss showed up and uh, started doing their sound check, and Gene Simmons is up on stage, and uh, all of a sudden he stops the uh, sound check, Gene Simmons, and he goes, uh, Kenny, come here. So Kenny went up to the stage, he goes, Kenny, Whose show is this? Kenny goes, well, it's your show, Gene. Gene Simmons goes, that's right, Kenny, and I want you to take down every one of those posters. So Kenny had to go around and take down every single one of those heavy metal love posters. I'm lucky enough to still have one left in uh, my basement. The idea for that day is going to come came about uh, when we were playing a club called Desiderio's, I believe it was, down in Tonawanda, New York. And uh, Paul and I were sitting down in the dressing room and we were looking at all these posters on the wall of uh, bands that had played there over the last 20 years or so. And uh, we were having a good chuckle because they were all wearing uh, these out of date clothes and had all these out of date hairdos. And we didn't recognize anybody in any of the photos. And just trying to think, well, whatever happened to these guys, you know? Uh, did they make it? Did they go on to something else? Uh, we got to talking about whatever happens to all these guys, right, and g girls, and uh, we thought it was a good idea for a song. Um, it was a few years after that where Paul was uh, tragically killed out in BC coming back from tour, and uh, at that time I was writing with Mark Ribbler down in, in Brooklyn, New York on a solo album, which eventually became uh, the uh, 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 Business Doing Pleasure album for Helix. And uh, I was writing with Mark and we had this lick and I uh, started coming up with a couple of lines, how long uh, must I stand here waiting for my train that never comes and um, got to thinking about that idea uh, that Paul and I came up with uh, in that dressing room in Tonawanda, New York and uh, I thought uh, it was a great idea for a song, we got it into the, the song and it became That Day Is Gonna Come. Metaphorically the uh, song uh, That Day Is Gonna Come is about our lives, me, Brent, uh, Paul and Daryl, uh, 
how you have to have that attitude that you're going to make it uh, against all odds, uh, or, you, or you never will make it because um, if you have doubt, then I think that uh, it's too hard of a business to uh, get to the end. You really have to uh, stick to it and uh, never give up. And that's really what we did, you know. We, we went for a long time uh, in this band and um, we're all like brothers. Uh, we lived uh, a lot of hard times together and a lot of good times as well. And uh, anyway, that's what this song's about, uh, our lives. That day is going to come. Uh, the version that we've got on the Unplugged album um, uh, is a little more earthy, a little more uh, uh, bare bones, and it was actually a lot of fun to record. I got to play some harp in it, and, uh, and uh, it just it has a nice flow to it. For the Wild in the Streets album, Capital enlisted the help of uh, Mike Stone to produce. Mike Stone at that time was one of the 10 top producers in the world and uh, we chose uh, Mike Stone over another producer by the name of, uh, I think his name was Mutt Lang. And uh, Mike Stone flew into Toronto and, and for some reason EMI Capital inadvertently forgot to pick him up at the airport and uh, Mike Stone uh, flipped out that they uh, left him stranded at the airport. So to make up to Mike Stone, uh, Capital took us out to the Million Dollar Saloon, which was a swanky a strip club up in Mississauga. And uh, we spent a lot of money, I think over $2,000 that night. We were in a VIP room and well, it ended up that, um, you know, it got a little out of hand. We decided, well, we're not gonna go record tonight. We went back to the Capital Records building and uh, opened up shop and decided to ramp, uh, go ramp it at the, uh, the the records building, uh, just everybody started partying. I guess we found the bar there and um, and we brought back some strippers that decided to hang out with the band. And There was not supposed to be anybody there at night except the janitors. And uh, Dean Cameron, the president of Capitol Records, somehow bribed these guys to let us in. And we got into the main boardroom where the uh, girls proceeded to do dances for us on the uh, big uh, table that they had in the boardroom. And uh, Dean Cameron, the president of Capitol Records, uh, open up the bar. I think uh, Daryl had a bit too much to drink, uh, so much so that he passed out in one of those swivel chairs and we tied him up in two inch recording tape and we left him in the front lobby of Capitol Records, uh, which um, must have been quite a spectacle from the street. We started uh, recording uh, the Wild and Street Selma at Phase One Studios in Toronto with Mike Stone and uh, uh, Mike wanted to take the project back to England. so. We had, by this time we had recorded three tracks, one of which was Dream On, but Dean Cameron wasn't happy with my uh, lead vocal. He thought I hadn't done a good job and that I could do a much better uh, uh, job on it. So when we got to uh, England and we were recording at Richard Branson's studio, The Manor, uh, every day I'd get up and I'd take another sh you know, try at this song. And uh, day after day it just kind of wore on and it wasn't getting any better. In fact, I think it was getting worse singing the song. Uh, till one day Mike, Stone, who didn't have a lot of patience to begin with, he just lost and he said, look it. He says, screw this. We're just going to uh, take the, the original vocal, do a different mix, and we're going to send it to him and tell him that, that, that you sang another version, right? So that's what he did. He did a, a mix with uh, the old vocal on that they hated, and we sent it back, and uh, they didn't know the difference, and they thought it was just great. Uh, on the uh, Walk in the Razor's Edge album, we had a huge hit with Rock U. Uh, so when we came around doing the Long Way to Heaven album, uh, Bill sent Paul down to write with Bob Halligan in New York City, who had been the writer in uh, Rock U. And uh, Paul came back from New York and he had a song called Deep Cuts a Knife, which we all listened to and thought it was a, a, a hit. And uh, at that time, we were practicing in Kitchen down on Bright Up Street. And, um, Tom Tremuth, I believe, brought down Alda Nova, who had a huge platinum album out at that time, uh, to come down and, and write with us. And uh, Alda Nova came down, he listened to the songs we'd been writing, and uh, in, while we were taking a break, he took me and uh, my manager, Bill Sipe, outside, and he uh, played us a song called Heart of Stone. And um, after he let us listen to it, he, he said, look it, he said, you know, that Deep Cuts a Knife song, it's okay, but I think my song's better. And um, I remember after he left, I said to Bill, I said, no way. I said, Deep Cuts a Knife is way better song than this thing, right? And so we stuck with Deep Cuts a Knife, and it became the first single 
off the Long Way to Heaven album, became the biggest uh, radio hit of the band's career, uh, gained double breaker status in the United States, which means that uh, uh, two-thirds of all the uh, radio stations in our genre of music at that time were playing that song in the United States. We used to get friends coming back that were truckers from, from the, uh, down in Missouri, a place like that, telling us that they were hearing the song on the radio. Uh, we ended up going to uh, Sweden and uh, touring all around Sweden, uh, probably the first Canadian band ever to tour that country. I had a number one album in Sweden, uh, mainly off the strength of that song. Um, and uh, really, really boosted the band's career. It was uh, not, uh, also no, uh, in the top seven at seven on Q107 in Toronto for I think about a month. So it was a huge hit for the band, and am I ever glad we didn't listen. In the early days of the band, when we used to get together to practice, uh, I used to uh, sing a song by a band called Foot and Call Water called Maybe Do Anything You Want. And I really loved uh, singing that song. And years later, when we got to the Walk and Razor's Edge album, we were short of material. I suggested that we do it. Uh, and it became a huge hit for the band, uh, almost becoming a cool single. Just another play, uh, You Can Do All the Glue You Want. You can do all the glue you want. <laughs> uh, the song Make Me Do was quite a, a memorable song because uh, live on stage, uh, every night Brian would, uh, at one point in the song, I guess it was the lead solo, he'd kind of go out to the crowd and he'd pick a, a girl out of the crowd, pick her up, bring her on stage and start dancing with her and pirouette, you know, all the kind of stuff that uh, kind of looks pretty romantic. I mean, gave the song a nice touch when he reaches out and he, grabs this girl out of the crowd, she comes up and Brian's dancing away with her, oh, it's just so sweet, schmutzy, schmutzy. And then all of a sudden she kind of drifts off and everybody's looking at Brian laughing and what's the big joke here? You know, she was bad looking, everybody realized it was a guy, it wasn't a girl. Brian didn't even realize it, so <laughs> it was uh, no more ugly chicks on stage. I'd, I'd never heard the song until we actually uh, recorded it and uh, just the memory of the song was how easy it came together and what a great vocal uh, performance Brian did on it. Uh, and just, you know, it, it's, it was almost a gold single for us in Canada. And uh, I'm kind of, kind of sad that it didn't make it the gold single because that would have made a nice addition to the wall here. I wrote Good to the Last Drop with Mark Gribbler down in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I'd written a couple songs previous to uh, that song with Mark, and uh, that particular day we had just finished off a song called Midnight Express. And we went out for supper, and uh, while we were sitting there eating, Mark said, look at it, he said, uh, he said I got an idea for another song called uh, Can Eat Just One. And I thought to myself, nah, I don't know about that title. It seems kind of clumsy even to say it. Uh, so I suggested to him, I said, what do you think about this one? Good to the last drop. He said, yeah, he said, I kind of like that. So we got back to uh, Mark's apartment and uh, we ended up polishing off the song in like half an hour. And uh, it ended up becoming one of the biggest songs of the band's career. Uh, our first top 40 hit in Canada. And uh, we went over and we were touring Europe at that, on that album with uh, Ian Gillum from Deep Purple. And I remember uh, I had, uh, planned on quitting the band, I basically had enough, uh, same reasons as Brent, no money, and just burnt out, and uh, we, I got to the end of the tour and I was at Linda's place, uh, she lived in Goldhawk Road in uh, London, England, and um, I got a call from Bill and he said, look it, he says, why don't you come home, he says, the uh, record company's really getting behind this track, and uh, they want you to do a video, so why quit the band now, you might as well uh, reap some of the fruits of your labor, and come back and give it a shot uh, and at least try for a few more months and make some money. The record company said, okay, we want you home to shoot a video. Now the only way we could get back was to take a, a Virgin Airlines flight into New York City uh, and be picked up in a van and driven directly to the set in Toronto. So there were five very tired musicians lying around in the back of this van when we pulled into Toronto to shoot the video. So, I came back to Canada and we did the video and, and sure enough the song became a huge hit for the band and uh, I'm glad that uh, I stuck with it because I'm still here today many many years later and uh, I can attribute it to that song.
What comes to mind when I think of the uh, acoustic versions of Wild in the Streets, uh, No Rest for the Wicked combo mixture on the Unplugged album is, uh, you know, uh, I knew that when we decided to work on an Unplugged album that, uh, you know, we wanted to, of course, change these songs up. I think... Uh, we put of a skip to my Lou, my darling type of uh, a boogie beat to it, and uh, and uh, just the transition from one to the other. It's kind of like two songs in one. For many many years, we'd uh, fooled around with that song on tour, uh, especially at Soundcheck, doing different things with it. And uh, I think we were in Prince Edward Island, uh, Sunnyside or Summerside, Summerside, and we just started playing a boogie beat to it, bum 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 bum, bum slower, da da bum bum. We started calling it Mild in the Streets. Uh, and we, we do that at Soundcheck for years, just to, to keep things interesting. And when we uh, decided to, to put it on the Unplugged album, we thought, well, you know what, we really like that version. It's, it's because it's so different from the original version. Uh, and we just kind of fell into throwing uh, No Rest for the Wicked along with it. More mandolin, baby, more mandolin. No Rest for the Wicked. I came about um, from listening to my dad actually when I was a kid and my dad used to lean on the fence talking to the next door neighbor Ivan Denstead and uh, Ivan would say so Warren how's it going and my dad would go well you know no rest for the wicked and that always stuck in my head and uh, years later I would write that into a song and kind of summed up what, what uh, Helix is all about because we toured incessantly and we were known as the hardest working band in Canada. Now, Wild on the Streets uh, was written uh, about five years after that, and uh, it was written by Paul and uh, a guy named Ray Lyle, who was also managed by uh, Bill Cyper, manager. And we recorded the song and we recorded uh, the album over at uh, uh, the Manor Studios in London, England, which was a place owned by Richard Branson, who owned uh, Virgin Airlines. I remember flying over to England to do the Wild on the Streets album with Mike Stone, and. Uh, we got into London, then we had to take uh, trains and stuff out to uh, where uh, the studio was. It was in a little, uh, outside of a little town called Killington, which was by Oxford, England. And um, we got arrived at this place and it was like unreal. It was like a castle. It was um, a huge mansion. It was like a castle back in the 17th, 18th century. It had a canal at the back with these little old boats that people lived in. It was so... It just takes you back, uh, like back in the werewolf, you know, British werewolf days of, you know, they, they had a church back there with a small little cemetery and a, and a, and a, a swimming. It was just an amazing, they had a, a go-kart track that went through a, um, a back of a field. And the day we had the go-karts, they, they got this guy who was a professional go-kart driver to show us how to drive this little go-kart that had gears and everything. And there's tunnels and... I mean, uh, it was quite the place. It was uh, visited by the, the man that owned it, Richard Branson from Virgin Airlines, who uh, came in one day and we were uh, uh, all around. I didn't really quite get to meet him. I know some of the guys got to talk to him, but uh, uh, I mean, just the people that went through that place, uh, just staying there, my room had a, a big rope that you could pull this rope. And as soon as you pull the rope, the, the maid's knocking on the door that opens up like this, these great big arched doors. And uh, it was, uh, it was like, you know, anytime you wanted to eat, you just phone down to the kitchen and... We each had a room and there was a, a woman that took care of the place. There was a snooker room and, and uh, upstairs there was a uh, hand-carved ship that Mike Oldfield had given Richard Branson uh, when he recorded Tubular Bells there. The uh, Sex Pistols had recorded Nevermind the Bollocks uh, at the studio and they... I remember there was a... Um, uh, something like a 13th century uh, trunk that they carved their name into. Uh, uh, but uh, it was just a wonderful experience. And then and then there was Mike Stone, who you get down to the uh, studio at 9 o'clock in the morning, he's already finished three quarters of his Chevy's Regal, so he'd throw you the keys to his Porsche sitting outside, go down to the downtown to get me some more booze. And I remember one time Daryl was doing some dubs, and he asked me to, and I, had, I got in his Porsche, so you're, you're driving on the wrong side on the wrong side of the road, I, I wasn't, and I was scared because, you know, I'm in this thousands and thousands of dollar uh, car, and I don't have to go far, maybe five miles. Got downtown, I felt like Joe Rockstar, you know, you pull up, and 
You, know, you look around, see who's looking to see who you're driving. Right? The window's got to be down, of course. Park it where everybody sees you park. Go in, get the bottle, come out, total rock puke bottle, you know, big car. Yeah, they're, they're totally stereotype. Get back in the car, brought it back to uh, Mike, and sure enough, I guess by 2 o'clock in the morning, he was down for the count. <laughs> From uh, the Manor Studios, then we moved into uh, London itself to Townhouse Studios where we did the mix. And uh, that was right down the street from um, where Linda, my wife-to-be, had her apartment. And uh, that's how I eventually met Linda was uh, on the second last day, I think, uh, I was out at a club called Zeta's and um, that's where I met her at that club. Touch Magic was a song written by James Leroy and I had a connection with James Leroy uh, many, many years ago in the uh, very beginning of the band. We had a gig uh, with Major Hoople's boarding house at the uh, Belgium Club in Delhi. And uh, James Leroy had joined Major Hoople's boarding house and it was in the band. And um, I remember after the show taking down uh, the gear and stuff and sitting around and uh, James Leroy was there and, and uh, having a talk with him for about a good 45 minutes at the end of the night and uh, I always wanted to do that song. The song was a huge hit in Canada. I think it was uh, like number one for something like 30 weeks in a row and uh, it wasn't until we did the smash hits and plugged down that we got an opportunity to actually do a version of the song. Uh, I think it fits in really well with the rest of the material on the album and um, you know it's kind of a tribute to James Leroy. He's been dead for a few years now but uh, a great songwriter and uh, it was an honor doing his uh, tune. Give me an R! Uh, first video that I shot with the band was the Rocky video and we, we did that in uh, I believe it was April of 1984 in downtown Toronto. It's right in the middle of downtown off the Don Valley Parkway. Toronto Brickworks and Unless you know it's there, you'd, you'd never think about it. You know, it's this pit that goes hundreds of feet into the ground with full of water at the bottom. And here we were dressed in, uh, in burlap bags, basically, with scantily clad women running around, uh, slipping and sliding all over the place, freezing our butts off, and it was a great experience. Uh, we first put Brock Hugh on stage at the Al Rosa Villa in uh, Columbus, Ohio. and. Uh, we knew from the very first night we put it on stage that the song was uh, going to be huge for us because the audience just went crazy when we first played it. Uh, we recorded it in Toronto at Phase 1 and um, when we went to do the video, uh, Capital enlisted the uh, help of uh, Rob Cordley from Champagne Productions. And Rob came up with the idea of uh, having us kind of dress up like the Flintstones because uh, the song did have the word rock in it. So we went to uh, the Toronto Brick Yards in Toronto, which was a this huge big quarry, and uh, we filmed it there with, uh, once again, some scantily clad females. And uh, what I remember from the video the most was uh, the, uh, the big breasted women they had hired for the video. Uh, they had to look like they were oiled up. So they had stage techs with baby oil, and, I, and they, these guys, their job, was to go over and get these things all oiled up for these girls and the girls just stand there and the guys and I'm thinking, buddy, you got the luckiest job in the world, man. Because, <laughs> I mean, everybody's watching him, eh? And he'd, he'd loop this one up and then he'd loop that one up and okay, these are okay. And then you go over to the next one and he's just, you could see he was a little tense about it, but loving every minute of it. <laughs> the water shot where Brent comes out of the water for a solo, we had to argue and argue with the director, we want this shot, we want this shot right down to the point where the manager, Bill Sype once again, uh, took him to one side and said, listen, I want this shot. So the last shot of the video was Brent coming out of the water for the lead solo. And he had to, in, in very, very cold conditions, and the water was close to freezing, get into the water, hide underneath it until it was the, the, the surface had, had stilled, and then come out playing guitar. And uh, we did, I think it was two takes of it, and rushed him up the, the hill into a hot shower and uh, some warm clothes. Brent came out of the water, which was the uh, real, uh, how can you say it, the uh, um, high point of the video. 
We ended up touring uh, that summer all across the United States in 20,000 seat arenas with White Snake and Quiet Riot. And uh, the song became our signature song, and it is to this day.